Welcome everyone to the On The Edge with Andrew Gold podcast. I'm here with Shalise Ansola of the Cults to Consciousness podcast, YouTube as well. It's everywhere. It's the best podcast, uh, you know, just go and look at it. She was brought up Mormon. We're going to be finding out all about what that entails, how she left, what's going on. After we had messed up one time, I think, I don't even think it was orals, probably something dumb. He came back with these list of rules. Don't allow a person of the opposite sex in your bedroom. Don't stay out with someone past midnight because the Holy ghost goes to bed at midnight yes that's a real oh, thing no. that's a real thing uh, <laughs> i can't believe that's a thing it's a real thing so all of us were always like is that eastern time pacific time like how does this work shalice tell us a bit about growing up Mormon. What, what's weird and strange about that? Well, hi, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. I was so excited when you reached out uh, because we have similar missions on our channel, just exposing the culty stuff and showing people the red flags and the warning signs so they don't have to get involved themselves. So that's kind of what I do on my podcast. And I use my experience as an ex-Mormon to relate to the guests and I think it provides a nice perspective because a lot of times, especially as a Mormon, people, strangers, like you meet them on the street, right? Hi, what's your name? Shalice, where are you from? Utah. Oh, are you Mormon? How many moms do you have? Do you have horns? Like they go into the weirdest <laughs> stuff. And so I know it can be really hard for people to tell their stories if they feel like they're just being gawked at and not really being understood. So yes, ex-Mormon, um, we can get super into the weeds with this, but I always start by saying I'm pioneer stock in air quotes because I come from like the longest line of Mormons. Um, one of the fun facts is that my great great grandma, I think it's two greats, maybe three, was the first woman to be baptized in England. So Mormons were doing a thing, like wow. going to other countries right at the beginning, converting people giving them big promises, hopes and dreams and bringing them over to Utah where they settled so that they could practice polygamy in peace for at least a few years until the government was like, yeah, you're not doing that. So they come over to Utah and then they're like, wait, I have to be a polygamous wife. And it was like bad news bears. So I come from that where it's like, I don't even know of a lineage of my family where they weren't Mormon. Um, and I don't know if your your listeners know this, but Mormonism is actually a very young religion. It was started in like 1830s. So it's not that old. And so I grew up in Utah, like the hub of Mormonism, super in a bubble, didn't know anything different, didn't really question the theology because nobody was asking me questions. And it was just kind of a way of life. And there's, of course, a million kajillion rules that you have to follow. But again, it's just like how life is. You don't really think about it much. And I moved to Oregon my senior year of high school. And this was also because I was like flipping through the scriptures and asking God and putting the finger on and then like, oh, the verse tells me I need to move. Um, my dad had been working there for a while. And so they had brought the idea up to me and I was like, hell no, I'm not moving until God told me that I should. So I ended up in in uh, Portland and that's when all the questions yeah. came. And Wait, people we're skipping ahead. We're skipping ahead. Are we skipping ahead? <laughs> We're skipping ahead. <laughs> yeah. We're getting okay. through your whole life story already. And then I won't have anything to talk about for the okay, next Okay. Yeah. What, what do you want Tell to dive me. into? <laughs> um, so, well, what, what is different, I suppose, about, about a Mormon childhood that, that maybe you thought was normal at the time? What are some examples of things that, that, that and you now realize, oh, that was a particularly strange thing? Yeah, that's a great question. The first thing that is super odd that some people don't know is that Mormons can't drink coffee or tea. What? And it's a really dumb rule. Yeah, even Mormons are kind of like, I guess, like, we'll just do it. And it comes from the word of wisdom, which Joseph Smith, who was the founder of Mormonism, just wrote up one day <clears throat> because Emma, his first wife, was sick and tired of picking up tobacco spit on the floor. And she was like, wouldn't it be great if God gave you a revelation that people shouldn't chew tobacco? And he was like, hmm. And then he was like, guess what, Emma? God gave me a revelation that you shouldn't use tobacco or drink alcohol, or uh, which is funny because they all had their own distilleries and like they still drank alcohol even though he said not to. But it was during the prohibition time that the church was like, see, the modern prophet knew exactly what was coming and we shouldn't drink alcohol. But then when it was allowed again, 
they couldn't really go back. And so that's when they became like really strict on the no alcohol thing. And the whole coffee and tea is just from like no hot drinks is what he said, because during those times, they thought that drinking hot things were bad for you. Now they interpret it as coffee and tea because there's like caffeine and we don't do addictive substances. So it's like a really weird, I don't know, translation, I guess, or interpretation of it. So that's one where if you saw someone drinking a cup of coffee, it was like, oh my gosh, they are breaking the word of wisdom. And you would get super judged. Wow. <laughs> yeah. what, do, you, do you remember your first ever coffee? So this is the funny thing. And I got some slack because I just did an interview with Apostate Alex and I said, I still don't drink coffee. And everyone was coming at me in the comments like she was great until she said she didn't like coffee. <laughs> but <laughs> I I guess I just never grew the taste for it. And never like I just don't like the taste. But I do love a good cup of tea. I'm a tea girl. So a good chai, a good English breakfast. I heard someone describe that as like tea is what adults who don't want to admit that they're just having warm milk can have. <laughs> like it's just warm milk water. And then it coffee. Is. I know I'm, I'm English. So I'm supposed to, I'm going to get attacked in the comments now because I'm supposed to love tea for some reason. <laughs> but then coffee I've only gotten into recently because my fiance sort of made me be into it because she's really into her like really specialty coffee and stuff. Uh -huh. So I quite like it, like a nice a nice sort of flat white or something, but but it's not like really nice, like like apple juice or something, is it? Well, I mean, to each their own, right? I love a good English breakfast tea, mm. but you're right. It's like heavy on the oat milk and some honey. So it's just, yeah, it's just a comforting, it's like a warm hug when you drink a cup of chai or English breakfast. So when was your first tea? My first tea. Okay, so this is also a little fun story. I... I was doing a study abroad in London for my fashion design um, career. And I went to a haunted castle for my 21st birthday in Ireland. My mom came over at the end of the semester and they brought us a cup of tea. And I didn't know how to say like, oh, I don't like tea. And so my mom was looking at me like, you better drink this tea. And I was like, okay. So I drank it and all of a sudden I was obsessed with tea. I was like, this is incredible. This is not the type of tea that I've ever had before. And that was my love of tea. That's where it started. But the funny thing is we went to a pub that night and they gave me like a birthday shot, right? And my mom looks over at me like, you know, drink that. It's your 21st birthday. And still I had left the church maybe like less than a year ago, but was still adamant. I was like, I don't want it. And I gave it to her. So that's another fun fact is I still don't drink alcohol. And I think it's because I just never, I never tried it. And then I never had the desire to try it. And I was like, I have a great time without it. And I don't feel like I need it. So that's another thing I still don't do. And people are like, it's because you're Mormon. I'm like, no, it's because I don't want to drink alcohol. <laughs> Yeah, well, good on you. You don't have to drink what they drink. I think that's ridiculous. I don't drink much. I don't think I've probably had any alcohol for like probably a year now. Um, and I never used to much either. I just, I came to realize, I think in a, in a very different um, journey to what you had, but uh, I just didn't like it that much. And yeah. I don't know why I'm drinking all this this alcohol that's not good for me. It makes me feel bad and do stupid things. And, and not that I did many stupid things. What's the point? So that's I think it's I genetic hear. as well. Some people love it. Mm. Yeah, that's what I hear. And also there's some like alcoholism in my family too. And I'm like, I just don't really want to chance it. Like I'm fine without it. And yeah. I feel yeah. good without it. I would much rather do like an edible weed gummy or something or drink some blue <laughs> lotus tea, which has like super chill effects. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think those things are better, much calmer than than the alcohol. It's like your head swims. Some, but some people, like I say, genetic, because like I lived in Germany for a while and people are just like in the cinema in the middle of the day, just everyone's got beers. Or just It was like water to them, it felt. Yeah. Well, maybe they would say the same about the British, to be honest, or the Irish and the Americans as well. Uh, and it just feels like, you know what, I, I don't want to be someone who functions on that on that stuff. But um, what, what, else, what else can you tell me about your upbringing that mm -hmm. was because I know that Mormons, for example, people talk about they're very smiley. That's one of the things, right? Yeah. Yeah. There is an air of perfectionism that you have to live up to. And if you don't, you feel like you have failed in every way possible, spiritually, as a parent or as a child, like you didn't live up to your parents' expectations. There's a lot of expectations put on Mormons. So 
if I could also give you an idea of what's expected when you're Mormon as far as the time commitment. So that's part of it too, where I thought it was just normal, but then I find out that there are people that just go to church on Easter and Christmas. And I'm like, that's available? Like, that's an option? <laughs> um, so I grew up where you go to church on Sunday. And when I was going, it was three hours long. It's not just like a quick sermon and you're out of there. Oh. You go to sacrament meeting, which is um, where they pass what we call sacrament, but it's communion, the bread, and mm -hmm. we don't get wine, of course, it's water. So uh, that's kind of a funny thing too. Yeah. And then after <laughs> that, yeah. And then after that, you go to, depending on your age, it's like primary where you're just with a bunch of little kids or it's Sunday school where you're learning more of the doctrine. And then you split up again. And if you're old enough, you go into young women's from ages 12 to 18, young men's for the boys. That's where you learn how to be a good housewife, a good uh, priesthood leader of the family and how to submit to your husband and all that stuff. And then, so yeah, so that's three hours. And it was a lot. So there was wow. that. And then on Mondays, you were yeah. supposed to do family home evening with your own family. So it's like church again, where you assign, like, usually they had those little um, boards that would have each child's name, because there was usually quite a few. Uh, my family wasn't that big. I just had two brothers at home with me. But you would have each child and someone would be in charge of a treat and someone would be in charge of the lesson and someone would be in charge of the song and someone would be in charge of the prayer and it would rotate every week. So it was like a full on little Sunday school lesson on Mondays. And then on Wednesday, if you were old enough, you would go to young women's or young men's and they called it mutual. So then you would go back to the church. You would do some sort of activity that related to Jesus or the script. Not really Jesus because they don't focus on Jesus funnily enough, but it would be focused on something of the church. Maybe it's for women. It would be this is how you crochet <laughs> or like this is how you make a meal. And then for boys, it's like this is how you build a tent. Uh, and then so that's on Wednesdays. And then in between, you kind of have time to yourself, but you're expected to read your scriptures morning and night, like when you wake up and before you go to bed, you're supposed to pray at least three times, pray before every meal. So that is why it's very much a high demand religion, because it demands a lot of your time. And then when you get older, you get callings. So these are all voluntary positions. So you get called to um, be the ward chorister and you have to be there every Sunday to lead the, the um, church in hymns. Or if you're the bishop, you're there almost every single day because you have to do really uncomfortable bishops interviews with children and adults and find out if they're worthy enough to go to the temple. So it's a lot. It's very high control. <laughs> That is a lot. And are there parts of that, though? And I only ask this because I like to get to sort of the gray zone. And so many people I've spoken to from various different religions have had similar experiences, but also quite enjoyed some parts of it. Were there parts of that childhood that you enjoyed? Did you enjoy the community feeling? Yeah. And that's a tricky question because that's something that a lot of people say is, well, I miss the community. I left my church and now I don't have that community, which is a valid thing to feel, right? But the thing that I always ask people to look at is when you leave a religion, if you say, hey, I no longer believe this anymore, and all of your friends completely disown you, you didn't have a community in the first place. You had people that had conditional love for you. You had people that only loved and accepted you because you believe the same thing as them. And to me, that's very fake. It's all a facade. So that's something that's another like fakey part about Mormonism as well as a perfection. Like you're trying to pretend like you're perfect and you're also like pretending to be someone's friend where they have something called visiting teaching or home teaching where every person like when you're an adult you're required to visit let's say three or four people every month and the thing is a lot of people don't want to do this but if you don't do it you get in trouble because you have to actually turn in your numbers and say yes i visited these f three people and so you have people who, who's come. Who's visiting? Who, so they're who visiting, visiting other people in the ward. So you could be, you could be assigned two people who regularly go to church, and two people who are they call inactive people who aren't going, and you want to like reactivate them. 
So, oh, wow. so that's another thing. Like when you leave, you still have people showing up at your door like, hey, you want some brownies? And the people, I want to make this very clear. The people who are doing the visiting teaching usually do it with a very kind heart. And they they really love you and they want you to be able to go to the right heaven. So they do it because they they care. But on the other hand, you have people that are just doing it for the numbers too and don't really want to be your friend but feel like they have to be. So it's really hard to distinguish who's actually your friend and who just wants to get a pat on the back for doing their numbers. So when you leave the community, it's like, did you have one to begin with? That's that's a sort of exaggerated take on uh, real life outside of religion because you sort of don't know um, who's really your friend and who will stay with you if you voice something that is unpopular. And, yeah. and, unlike, and, and I can see how in that kind of community, it's like times times 100, you know? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So when it comes to religious communities, usually one or two things happen. And this is true for Mormonism. When you leave or say, I no longer believe it, they'll either love bomb you to try to get you back or they completely cut you off because you're an apostate and they don't want to associate with you. Because one of the questions for the temple interviews is, are you associating with people who don't believe or people who are going against the church or, you know, apostates really? And you don't want your own salvation to be tainted by just being friends with someone who believes something different. So it's really tricky. And your first question was, is there anything that I miss about Mormonism? I can't say I miss the community. And I I can say this honestly, because when I moved to California, right when I got home from London, my first thought was, I need to make friends. I don't know anybody out here in Los Angeles. So I went to church just to make friends. And I could not stomach it. Like I wanted to scream. Once those goggles are off and you see things with a clear brain, they were talking about something in uh, Young Women's or Relief Society, I guess they would call it. It's so weird, the names Mm -hmm. uh, for the older women when you split off. They were talking about chastity and the things you have to sacrifice to go to the temple and you have to be morally strong and you can't you can't have sex before marriage and like you you have to stay chaste and pure and virtuous. And I wanted to scream. I was just like, this is not okay. First of all, we're not even talking about Jesus. Jesus is nowhere to be found in the discussion. We're just talking about how to be good Latter-day Saints. And all of that comes with so much restriction and guilt and shame that it's just too much. So when I went there to make friends, I was like, why am I going to a place where I don't share the same values anymore as these people as far as what I find important in my life? And it's all fake. It's just like, it was just too much. So I don't miss the community. Uh, I think the activities were fun as a kid. Um, the young women's camps where we went and did horseback riding and zip lining or whatever, like that stuff's fun, but you can do that without it being yeah. in a religious context and without having to tie it back to the scriptures somehow. Would you say then that maybe Christianity is a religion and, and does Mormonism then sort of delve into the cultishness? That's a good question. Mormons believe that they are Christian, so they don't believe that there's a difference. And I get so much flack for this because people just go nuts and they're like, Mormonism is not Christianity. But And I understand where they're coming from, but I didn't realize until later that Christianity believes in the Trinity and Mormons don't. Uh, It was something that Joseph Smith in the early days realized that oh, I'm not different from other religions if I believe in the Trinity. And so he went back through the Book of Mormon and changed it to be three separate Uh, people, uh, Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And even with his first vision account, which is what started the whole religion, he claims that God and Jesus literally descended from heaven and told him, none of these religions are true. You need to start my true church. And that has like multiple accounts. That was one of my shelf breakers when I found out there was like seven different versions over a few different years. And the early members of the church didn't even know about the first vision until like 10 years later. And I'm thinking, what? That's like the whole, st- the inception story. And it wasn't important at all. And now they're like heavily focused on it and they don't use the first or the last version. They use like something in the middle. So that was a big red flag to me. And so when it comes to Christianity, 
I I will be completely honest in saying I don't know all the ins and outs of all the different sex of it and the the different breakoffs and um I don't know the the right word I'm looking for. But when it comes to Mormonism, they believe that they are Christian, but there's a lot of things that are different because they call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But there are a lot of things that they don't necessarily follow. So when I was Mormon, I can just talk from my own perspective. They would, I, I would personally say to people, like when I got to Oregon, I would say, oh, no, 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 we're Christian. We just believe more. We just have an additional book. <laughs> like you have the Bible. Mormonism. We have, we have the Bible and the Book of Mormon that go hand in hand and they answer each other's questions. And I didn't find out until later that the reason that they <clears throat> were kind of compatible was because Joseph Smith was basically like forging. <laughs> it was like all a forgery of like the Bible. And he was stealing parts of it. And then the parts that didn't match, he would literally retranslate. So it's we have the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. So that's how he made them so compatible, but they're really not. Mm. <laughs> So. It's, it's interesting because that there's there's of course that South Park uh, episode. And yeah, we've got Joseph Smith sort of. It's like a it's almost that South Park episode is like a take on the Salman Rushdie, the Satanic verses where he describes. I, I don't even want to say what he describes because it nearly got him killed. So, uh, but he basically it's like that Joseph Smith where he's sort of just going about changing uh, the, the the whatever just to suit him. At what point did you see that? I mean, have you seen that South Park episode? Yeah. So some members of my family, I don't want to name them, but they were not into Mormonism and they were just like, so it's like, come on. I was the most spiritual one of the family. I was like super righteous and Ooh. followed all the rules and they loved South Park. So they sat me down to watch it and I just scoffed through the whole thing. I was like, this is so dumb. <laughs> None of this is true. The whole head in the hat thing, that never happened. Like, why do people keep saying Joseph Smith translated with his head in a hat? I was just so annoyed with it. And then I find out later that it's completely true because I also didn't know that the creators of South Park are Mormon. So they knew all the things. And yeah, I, they? yeah, yeah, they, I think they but went one on of, missions. One of them's Jewish. Really? I think one of them, at least one yeah. of them, went on a mission. Okay, yeah. we'll have to huh. Google it and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I was told is that they were ex-Mormon. So, and that's oh, right. why it would make sense that they would create the Book of Mormon play because they knew so much oh, about they it. Might have, I think I think they might have told you that as like a, and don't worry, you can watch this because they're, they're ex-Mormon themselves. Because I, I think one of them was raised Catholic and the, the other is an atheist. Have Jew. I had the wrong information for all these years? Well, there we go. I, I stand Possibly. corrected. Either way, <laughs> that episode, I watched it again later, was 100% spot on, like completely. And I found out it's like, it's so embarrassing when you find out all of these things that you were lied to about and you told other people the wrong information. So when my friend had an intervention with me in her car and was like, you're going to go to hell if you don't believe the real Christian way. And I'm like, girl none of that stuff you read about Mormonism is true. I would know because I'm a Mormon. And uh, it's just embarrassing to know that all the stuff that she did present me was actually true, including the head in the hat translating the Book of Mormon. Man. So so that, what does that, I guess, show you? <laughs> like knowing how you felt watching that South Park episode, which just presented everything as ridiculous as it was, what does it tell you about how you, if you wanted to, how you could uh, get somebody out of a cult or an extreme religion or something? I would say that that is 100% not the way to do it. <laughs> 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 because if you go up to someone and say you're in a cult, they will immediately put up their walls and they won't listen to a single thing that you say. You have to plant seeds over time. You have to get them to get curious. You have to ask the right questions that make them not defensive and actually want to know the answers. And sometimes even then, you're not going to get to someone until they're so completely defeated like I was to where they're like, to hell with this, I need to find out if this is true. Because a lot of times it takes a complete emotional break or a complete change in scenery, change in environment, plucking you out of what you knew 
to go, oh, this is weird. Maybe I should look into this. And my red flags are going off and I don't know how I feel about this and I should actually look into it. You have to get them to want to look into it themselves or else they're not going to be open to any of the information because they've been told that anything that sounds not great about their religion or their <clears throat> their group is just anti-Mormon or it's just people who are trying to bring it down because it's such a light in the world that Satan wants to destroy it. So why would they listen to you? <laughs> it's so difficult that, isn't it? Um, tell me, you had an incident with a, a bishop. Um, what was that about? My bishop's interview, the one to rule them all. So to give you a little bit of context, from the time that you're 12 years old and up, you go to the bishop regularly to confess your sins. It's like a confessional, except these guys are not trained clergymen. They are literally random dudes in your ward that have just been appointed. So I think they serve for like five years or something, and then they just switch it out. So it could literally be your neighborhood dentist. It could be your dad. It could be your friend's dad. There's no telling. Like The thing that's bad about that is they have put into these positions of power, men who are abusers, men who do horrible things and are convicted later. Oh my God. So it's like the wild, wild west of bishops. You may get someone who is kind and loving and and knows how to handle people and children in these sensitive ways, but you may not. You may get someone that's awful. <laughs> so speaking of awful, when I finally got to the point of my shelf breaking, you know, that's what we say is like, oh, this doesn't make sense. I'll put it on the shelf. This item doesn't make sense. I'll just shelf it until eventually there's so many things on the shelf that it breaks. And you're like, what am I even doing here? None of this works. So what had happened was I was in a relationship with my boyfriend for about a year. We still hadn't had sex because according to Mormonism, that's the sin next to murder. And you don't want to do that. And Anything that is like kissing longer than a few seconds is considered a sin and you're supposed to go repent. And I swear I won't do it again, but it happens because you're teenagers and you have a sex drive and you're human and it's normal. <clears throat> so we, he had convinced me to give him head. Oh no, that's like the worst thing in the world. And I was down. So it happens. And then immediately he goes, Oh yeah, we should really repent for this. I was like, are you oh. kidding me? <laughs> yeah. I was this so guy gets mad. to just like get what he wants and then regrets it immediately once his sex drive's gone and goes, We should repent. Like he wants it like cake and eat it. Yes, exactly. I was so annoyed and I'm just thinking, Are you serious? Like I never would have done it if you didn't want me to. And then he just immediately retreats. And that's like I can't even blame him for it because that's how men are trained. You're not even allowed to masturbate. So, so of course, like the drive is so strong. And we, uh, we even got this stupid list of rules. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the ones that I remember because you're going to crack up. So after we had messed up one time, I think, I don't even think it was orals, probably something dumb. He came back with with these list of rules. It was like on a bright orange sheet of paper and it was like ways to stay chaste. And I'm just like, okay, <sighs> this is stuff that you tell fifth graders, it's like wait until you're married, till you're ready to have sex. <sighs> so this list said things like, don't allow a person of the opposite sex in your bedroom. Don't stay out with someone past midnight because the Holy Ghost goes to bed at midnight. <laughs> yes, that's a real oh, thing. No. That's a real thing. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe that's a thing. <laughs> it's a real thing. So all of us were always like, is that Eastern time, Pacific time? <laughs> like, yeah. how does this work? Um, there were things like never lie down while you're kissing, never lie on top of each other, never kiss more than two seconds, never hug more than two mm. seconds. Like, dumb rules so there was a night where i uh he gave me the list and i was like all right let's do this so he grabbed his laundry and he walks into the bedroom and i just stop at the door and he's like what are you doing i was like i can't come in your bedroom we had been dating for a year so i just want everyone to have that in their head like this is not someone wow. i just met and and then that night we're watching a movie and i look at the clock i'm like well it's midnight gotta go and he's like don't you want to finish the movie I would love to finish the movie, but it's midnight and I can't be here anymore. So I was so petty about it. 
Yeah, I was going to say, were you proving a point? <laughs> oh, I was proving every point, every point on that list of Good. how dumb it was. And so yeah. anyway, we the list we threw out the list and that's when we messed up again and that's when he felt guilty. So we go into the bishop's office and you have to go individually. You can't go together. And it's like on a random Wednesday, no one's in the church building, thank goodness, because when people see you go into the bishop's office, it's like, are they doing a checkup or have they sinned? You know, the the question oh of the gosh. day. So I go into the bishop's office and I'm just like shaking. I'm nervous. I feel like the worst person in the world. And I tell him through my sobs, like, we messed up and I'm sorry and it'll never happen again. And then he starts with, well, I'm really glad you told me, Shalise. And I talked to your boyfriend earlier and he told me what happened. And and then he goes into, he goes into, I don't think you guys should be together because I feel like you're a bad influence on him. Wow. Yes. He probably told the bishop about your petty saying stuff about the <laughs> he list. He probably did. <laughs> I never yeah. thought about that. Oh. Um, so <laughs> he says, yeah, I advise that you shouldn't be together. And mind you, I'm 19. This is the age you get married when you're Mormon as a girl. Right. You're supposed to marry a return missionary and have kids right away. So we had been dating for a year, which is actually a really long time in Mormon standards. So I was like what? I want to marry this person. And you're telling me that we should break up. None of it made sense to me. And I loved him so much. And he says, okay, well, the punishment for you is going to be a year without the temple and a few months of not taking the sacrament. And my jaw hit the floor because I grew up knowing that the punishment for having sex, like actual sex, is a year. And he's telling me that the punishment for oral sex is a year. I lost my mind. Like I got super spicy and I completely stood up for myself. And the first thing I said <clears throat> was, aren't you supposed to pray about that? And he got so mad huh. because technically the bishop is supposed to hear out the sinner and then they're supposed to go to God and say, God, Shalise did this thing. What do you think we should do? And then God is supposed to say like, well, give her a few months in <laughs> spirit prison. Just kidding. Whatever it is. And he didn't do that. And so he's like, are you questioning my authority? I was like, yeah, because I think a year is too long. It's not even sex. I should have just had sex. I'm still a virgin. Doesn't that count for something? <laughs> and he was like, no, like he was not impressed at all that I was a 19 year old virgin, which I was super impressed by. Well, some would say that that oral sex is is actually more intimate than 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 sort of typical se uh, intercourse. So I think you bring up a good point, and this is why I fought it so hard. And it is more intimate. But when the reason that penetrative sex is such a sin against God is because you're messing with procreation. Like you could have a child, and that's why it's such a sin because. It should be reserved for procreation between a husband and a wife. So in my mind, I said, okay, but why, why is oral sex bad if it's just a kiss? It's just kissing on another part of the body. Like I'm not making a baby. <laughs> so he was like, no, Shalice, <laughs> yeah. it is not just kissing on another part of the body. Oral sex is unnatural. Oral sex is nowhere to be found in the Bible. And he starts going on about oral sex being not okay. And my He's mind not any. my mind is being blown at this point. I'm just like, what are you talking mm. about? Like there's lots of things that aren't in the Bible that humans do. Like why is that an argument? And I found out later someone wrote in the comments it actually is in the Bible. I should have known that. Um oh. Yeah, I don't I can't tell you which verse, but someone wrote in the comments at one point it's in the Bible. Um so to, I to, as a suggestion or like a something you no, shouldn't do. Oh no, someone had said it was just like a story about <clears throat> oral sex in the Bible. So it wasn't about like it being right or wrong, it was just a story about it. Just happens. Jo yeah, Jonah it just in happened. the wild. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um so yeah, after that I found out later that the reason he felt that way is because in the 80s they actually did ban oral sex with married couples. 
the the prophet came out and said it's unnatural it's sinful you shouldn't do it even within the confines of marriage people were so pissed off that eventually they had to get rid of it because of course married couples uh. were like we're married we should be able to do whatever we want so that's where he was coming from with that yeah so yeah. he's <laughs> he's got issues can you imagine being inside that bishop's head ah uh, yeah yeah and i heard stories about that bishop as well that he was asking far too many questions probing questions about these sexual sins from other women like he was getting off on it which is so disgusting so it is <clears throat> that that's a big thing in jehovah's witnesses as well i've heard there's a lot of that with like the elders they really ask a yeah. lot of questions and like specifics it's mm -hmm. like you don't need to know that like you're getting off on that mm -hmm. yeah they'll ask the women did you orgasm did you like it like really like questions that have no i mean none of these questions should be asked at all anyway but they're going way too deep into the line of questioning so i went from going in feeling awful to being enraged to completely sobbing to being enraged to at the end i i was defeated i left the office sat in my car and just bawled and i remember calling my mom and telling her um, Bishop says I'm not spiritual enough and I need to try harder and she thinks I need to break up with my boyfriend and she was enraged because she's like what do you mean not spiritual enough you are the most spiritual person that I know because again like I was reading the scriptures every night I was praying I I was doing all the things the rules that I were breaking were this I lived in Vegas by the way so I was a saint for what I could have been doing the rules that I were breaking was I was Working on Sundays, which is not allowed. I worked at Hard Rock Hotel at rehab at like the the pool party and was wearing a bikini because that was the uniform. You're not allowed to wear bikinis. You're supposed to wear one pieces. So I was breaking the modesty rule, the working on Sundays and this chastity rule. But other than that, I had never tasted alcohol. I had never tried weed or tobacco. I never drank coffee, didn't try tea. Um, all the other rules, going to church every Sunday, going to the activities. And so I was just flabbergasted. But the sad thing was I believed him. I believed that I wasn't worthy enough. And I believed that I should be ashamed for wanting to connect intimately with my boyfriend. And it was not okay. It was a really, really low point in my life. I have never felt that low. And that is what got me to question everything. Are there, I mean, this is something that, again, you know, I've obviously heard, particularly with Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, this shame around sexuality. Yeah. Is, is this something that now you can speak to ex-Mormons about? And the reason I mention that is because one of your most popular videos, and, and again, I do I do insist people check out uh, Cults to Consciousness YouTube channel and the podcast, of course, as well. Um, uh, there was something about, what is it? Okay, dr dry farming and e-quaking. Yeah, e soaking. I didn't, get to, I didn't get to watch that in the end. So tell me, what, what are these things? Yeah, that's a fun little segue here out of the guilt and shame train into something funny. Because all of these things are not allowed, Mormons will do insane mental gymnastics to make things okay in their head. That doesn't mean they're allowed technically, but it means if I don't have sex, maybe the sin and the punishment won't be as bad. So for example, this one has been flying around the internet the last year. People got wind of it and were just totally amused and it's called soaking. And would you like me to explain what soaking is to your listeners? Um, yeah, maybe not in too much, but, but yeah, go, go on. I will I will try and do it in terms that are not so graphic, but I'm worried about all the bishops out there listening in and getting a kick out of it. <laughs> okay. So soaking is in regular people's terms, it is intercourse. But according to the Mormons who do it and justify it as not sex, it's where the man enters the woman and doesn't thrust. He just leaves it there. So soaking. Okay. Like if you're not thrusting. Like a pickle then it's not technically sex. Like a what? Like a pickle, just slowly pickling. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. So that's soaking. And then there's another one that BYU students claim is real and everyone comes at me again and is like, that's not a real thing, stop saying that. And then other people in my DMs are like, oh yeah, I had roommates that did that. So 
their bunk beds in the dorms. And if someone on the top bunk is soaking, you can have a third party kick the bottom of the bed to create movement. Shut You're up. not moving. No, <laughs> that's not a thing. <laughs> Apparently it is a thing. Is, is now, that e-quaking? Here's my, that's earthquaking, yeah. So I can't say that if you're a Mormon, you soak and you earthquake. Like that's not, one does not equal the other, but it does happen. And it happens because people are so sexually repressed and they're so desperate to get off in some way that doesn't feel like a sin that they will do whatever it takes to make it make sense in their head. So people will say, well, clearly that's a sin and your bishop would never say that soaking is okay. Yes, I know that. But just like I was trying to say, well, oral sex isn't really sex, you justify things because your natural biology is wanting to experience these normal sexual arousals and these normal sexual feelings. So you're going to try and bend the rules and make it work so that you can still feel like you're not going crazy without putting your salvation on the line. I can hear f from just how you speak that you, you're much more liberated now in, in, in terms of speaking about sexuality and stuff, which I think is, is fantastic and a very positive thing. Are, are there ways that the shame that you grew up with still sort of manifests itself in you? Yeah, and that's a great question. I think I left the church, it's been 11 or 12 years now. So I've had a lot of time to sow my wild oats and be like a normal person in their 20s. And I will say that sometimes things creep in, thoughts creep in like, oh, was that, you know, back in my dating life, was that like a whorish thing to do? And I'm like, well, no, we've been dating for a while and it's fine to have sex with your boyfriend and it's, it's fine to explore and to try new things. But yeah, it creeps up because it's in your programming. The first Bishop's interview that I ever had about sexuality, I think I was... 15 maybe six maybe 16 and i went in and felt so much shame about the thing that you mentioned on my video which is dry farming and that's what utahns call basically grinding on each other with your clothes on right. while you make out okay so yeah. i felt like the worst person in the world and there was a, a war temple trip happening where the young women were going to do baptisms for the dead another super culty thing like no dead person <laughs> consented to be baptized into Mormonism. Uh, so we would go and do that, but you could only go if you were worthy, which means you had to have a bishop's interview. And one of the questions is, are you living the law of chastity? And you have to answer honestly, or else you feel even worse if you lie and then go to the temple of the Lord where God is literally walking the hallways and knows that you lied to be there. But if you sin and you confess it to the bishop, he might not let you go. And then all your friends are going to know that you're not worthy enough to go. So I remember going in and telling the bishop, oh, bishop, I, I was laying down and I was on top of my boyfriend. and We were kissing and um, we moved a little bit. And yeah. And he just looked at me. And luckily, I had a great bishop at that time. And he's like, Shalise, you're more than worthy to go to the temple. But that doesn't always happen. You know, I could have had a bishop like I did the second time that said, yeah, you've broken the law of chastity. You can't go to the temple. So you are conditioned even since 12 to believe that showing your shoulder, like if I couldn't wear this in Mormonism because my shoulders are showing even just a little bit, um, it's way too low. The cleavage is showing like it has to be up here and here. And that's why they have garments, the, the magic underwear that once you go to the temple as an adult, you have to wear them every single day and that keeps you modest. So we learn as 12 year olds that your shoulders will tempt men into doing bad things. And it's your fault if something happens to you because you weren't you weren't being modest and you were giving men impure thoughts and your body is too tempting. And so you're like forced to cower and hide yourself and not embrace your sexuality and not know how to have healthy sexuality. You're, you're only taught abstinence. You don't know by the time you get there. Let's say something happens to you and you don't realize that it wasn't consensual because it just happened and, and you didn't know how to set boundaries. You didn't know how to ask for what you wanted. You didn't know if it was supposed to hurt or if it wasn't supposed to hurt. And it's so damaging. That's why I did an entire episode, the one you're mentioning with Exmo Lex on 
the damages of purity culture because there's just so much to talk about. And yes, it permeates you into every every day of your life all the way through adulthood unless you are actively trying to deprogram and reprogram your thoughts into a healthy way. Man, it's it's so interesting to hear, like firstly, how many of these things are similar across different religions and cults and things. And then also how much this is, I suppose, an exaggeration of what we see in society anyway, because uh, women, there is that sort of culture, less and less, hopefully, of, of blaming women for, for men's sort of uh, wanting to jump on them and stuff. What was really interesting was yeah. a, a Hasidic Jewish woman I spoke to recently, Julia Hart, um, and she's got, the, her, the, she's got a reality show in her first episode her um her daughter there's a scene of her daughter and the daughter's husband and they're quite young and trying to work out this life on the outside now because they both left the hasidic jewish community and she walks in one time and she's wearing jeans and like a low cut top and he's like oh what are you wearing there and i thought he was going to be upset because you could see like cleavage and shoulders and neck and all these things but it wasn't that he didn't even notice that it was the jeans because jeans are mm, what a, the man too wears tight. No, the man wears jeans and it's a man thing. So it was just like, and he was, like, oh. I, he was like, I know we've left, but I don't know if I can handle jeans. He was like, I'm okay with the outside world now, but not jeans. Wow. That is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. That is fascinating. I mean, yeah, Mormons, you can't wear pants when you go to church for women. You right. have to wear a skirt. It was like this huge uproar when these women were like, no, we're going to wear pants and not jeans, but like nice pantsuits and... Oh, people were so mad. I cannot believe they're wearing wow. pants to church. And I'm thinking, why does God care what you wear to church? If you're there to praise him and worship him, it shouldn't matter what you wear. It, like, they're missing the point. That's I think yeah. <laughs> if I had to sum up Mormonism, they're missing the point in a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, you know, it's just it's just a way I think for men to control women, men to control other men, people to control each other and i suppose that's a big yeah. part of, of cults isn't it mm -hmm. and I, I guess like uh, maybe that's part of the human condition do, do you find that to sort of because it must have been when you left I, I guess when you're in a cult or you're in a religion you're in a community or or whatever you, there's there's control around you and you've got control and everything and then yeah. suddenly you're on the outside world did you suddenly feel like open in in a scary way to the world oh yeah two things happen when you realize that the group you've been a part of is based on lies <laughs> and just been controlling and manipulating you your whole life. The first thing is, oh wait, that means I can have oral sex and not be punished? Or like, wait, does that mean I can wear two piercings in my ear instead of one? That's a real rule in Mormonism. Wait, does that mean I can try tea? <laughs> you get really excited all of a sudden that yeah. you're no longer living in this box. You have the whole world to explore. The second thing is, oh shit, I don't know what's true. I don't know who I am. My entire identity is wrapped up in this. My mm. thoughts about myself, about other people are completely tied into this religion. Are Jesus real? Are Jesus and God real? Am I supposed to be a Christian now? Do I even believe in Christian? Is that made up? Everything completely tumbles down. I always say it's like a Jenga tower. Like when you're in the religion, you kind of pull blocks out like, mm, I don't like that my church was super racist. It's fine. I'll just get that one out of there. I don't really like that Joseph Smith married mother-daughter pairs and sister pairs. I'm just going to pull that block out. And then by the end, when you're like, oh, wait, Joseph Smith completely just made up the Book of Mormon and we have proof of that. The whole bottom just comes out. Every brick comes tumbling down, including your personality, sometimes your friends, your family, your environment, your community, everything. And you're just stuck going, okay, this is fun. Like I'm excited to rebuild, but also how do I do that? In Mormonism, there is no question about anything. We know what happened before we came to earth. We know what's gonna happen when we leave no questions. So when you have this uncertainty, it's scary, but it's also exciting. So it's it's a really hard place to be in. Mm. And, and, and how do you feel about, because um, you were saying there were sort of rhetorical questions, okay, well, is Jesus real and stuff like that? Are, are you spiritual now? Because I've, I've heard you speak of getting a vision that took you to, a, to, to do a podcast and things like that. So, so where are you with that? Yeah. 
Yeah, so the vision happened. And if you've uh, experienced psychedelics, you'll be like, oh, yes, vision. So I wasn't just like laying there one night and got a vision like Joseph Smith. It was like <laughs> very clearly induced. Um, but yeah, 10 years after I left, I hit rock bottom again. Like something horrible happened in my life. I just didn't know what to do about it. I somehow, I believe, manifested this amazing ayahuasca retreat in Peru to where I not only got to go for free, I got paid to go as an actor and help them get promotional footage for the center. So during my ayahuasca um, journeys, I had incredible healing experiences for this trauma that had just been uncovered. I was told, you know, you need to write a book, you need to speak about your experiences, which I replied, hell no, like, I'm not doing that, you're crazy. And whoever, whatever entity or spirit or thing in my head was there was very persistent and said, no, you're going to do this. So that's when I started looking into Mormonism more deeply, because I thought if I'm going to write about it, I need to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Turns out I had no idea about Mormonism when I was a Mormon. <laughs> I know way more now than I ever did. And that's when I was connected with another podcast called Mormons on Mushrooms, and they wanted to do some creative, creative differences, I'll say, and didn't want me on as a host anymore. And so that's when I was like, I think this is fun and I want to do it for myself. And that's how I ended up creating my own podcast eight months ago. What were the so creative it's di been quite a journey. Oh, do we get into this? I want some um, gossip. <laughs> some gossip well okay the long and short of it is this there were two really sweet guys best friends uh they did an ayahuasca journey and they felt impressed to create a podcast about their trip stories they were trolling some ex-mormon pages that i had followed and were, were commenting on saw that i was active started commenting on my stuff so when i went to their page and i saw mormons on mushrooms i was like i don't know what you're doing but i'm in this sounds awesome i had just been introduced to plant medicine i was an ex-mormon it made sense i was brought on as their first guest and then they're like you're amazing we want to hear more and so then i came on again and then eventually they're like you should be a co-host and i was like oh i don't want to infringe like you guys have a thing going and they're like no you're a co-host so i would come on periodically and help with the guests or we would just do um episodes with the three of us and it was a great time until it wasn't they kind of started ghosting me a little bit and uh eventually it was like the talk where you know shalice you've been great but we don't want you to be co-host anymore and oh. i was just like oh why <laughs> they, they didn't really have a reason it was uh it was heartbreaking, and I, that's why I did a whole episode on it, like, in real time as it was happening, why I left Mormons on Mushrooms podcast. Wow. And it's kind of, it was kind of sad, because I felt like I was a huge reason it blew up so much, because there were a lot of concepts that they didn't know about that I was introducing them to, and they were getting guests to talk about them, and it really turned into a different podcast than two guys telling trip stories, hmm. and I don't think they liked it. Like, they were growing so fast. We had a huge community. They ended up firing everyone that was working for them for free. They separated themselves from the community. Like, we don't want to be involved, and it just felt... Like they were, sh they wanted to shrink on purpose and I was trying to get them to continue to grow. Yeah. And they didn't want that. So I was like, well, I guess I'll grow on my own. And <laughs> that's what I've been able to do so far, which has been great. I never would have anticipated so many views and so many subscribers in such a short period of time. But I guess I'm, I'm happy that I'm doing it on my own yeah, and you don't need those creating guys. something that I love and yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Screw Thanks, them. Andrew. Well, they, yeah. they, maybe they, I don't know, maybe they spoke to that bishop and he's been like trying to convince them, don't work with her or something. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's the patriarchy. I don't know. Yeah, I, boo. a lot of people, a lot of people from the outside looking in said, man, you can take the man out of the cult, but you can't take the patriarchy out of the man. And I guess in some ways it felt that way. It felt like they, in classical patriarchy terms, you use a woman for her time and her talents. And then as soon as you get the success that you need, you say, okay, bye, we don't need you anymore. In some ways, it really felt that way. Um, I don't think personally, they are patriarchal men, like as a human being, they're very kind and sweet and generous. I do think that it's possible that some of those programs are still running in the background to where they don't even realize the things that they're doing that are wrong. Like they just went about it in all the wrong ways. It's totally fine to have creative differences. It's fine to want to go a different direction. But 
the way that it was handled was so heartbreaking and it felt like I was being discarded. And the thing was, <laughs> they didn't realize it. They're like, oh, we didn't think you'd be upset. I'm like, I was on this podcast for two years and I was promoting it on my social media platform that I have worked on and gained hundreds of thousands of people, you know, over six years time and I'm promoting it and I'm helping like I would create events and do like all this work for them. And they just didn't think it was an issue that I was being demoted. And so there was just a lot of things that that weren't handled correctly, I would say, or could have been handled better. On that note, I think there's there's a the note of a lot of things being retained from the upbringing or from the cult or the community or whatever. I've often noticed uh, people leaving these cults and leaving this sort of community of, you know, competitive righteousness, which is what a lot of cults and communities are, uh, and then continuing along that path, but in a very, you know, secular way, uh, whether it be, you know, this sort of going very right wing or going very left wing and what we'd call woke or whatever, and just being like really mm -hmm. sure and really like, and I always think like, I can't believe you're that certain because you know, before, do you know what I mean? Do, do, do you come across people yeah. like that? Yeah, and I've even been accused of that okay. where I have a more magical worldview. I, you were asking about where I landed as far as spirituality. I do believe in some sort of higher power. I don't think it's a, a dude on a throne with a white beard saying, you go to heaven and you go to hell. <laughs> like if that doesn't resonate with me, but I do have more of like a magical worldview um, being like part of source and I have like the energy thing. I love crystals. And some people will say, you just left one cult for another. And I'm thinking, I understand how spirituality can be culty. And there are certainly cults that revolve around yoga and <laughs> and um, shamans and things. But as far as I personally go, I don't have anyone that I'm paying money to to tell me like how to live my life. I don't have anyone who is telling me how to live my life, whether I pay them or not. I go by my own intuition, by what feels right to me, by what feels most exciting and the the least harmful path is the one I wanna take. I wanna help people, not hurt people. So when it comes to that, I feel like while it can become a culty mindset, I'm very careful to let it not become that because like you said, I have been duped in the past and it's really easy to get duped again, 100%. Like I even fell into the whole MLM thing, which is very culty oh, because no. it felt normal. Like yeah. I, I won't say that I got completely invested and I didn't really spend any money on it, but I, I was very susceptible to that. And you are when you leave a high demand group, you're susceptible and vulnerable to those things because it's what you know, like someone telling you how to be and what to do and it, it feels normal and it's hard to recognize that you're continuously being controlled, even ending up in relationships with narcissists, which I have done because it's another controlling situation where the oppression feels normal. And if you're not actively being self-aware, which is what I think consciousness is, my cults to consciousness, becoming very self-aware and realizing that I have my own self-sovereignty. If you aren't being that, then it's easy to slip into something else. So I, I'm in the school of thought of there's so many things that I don't know and that's okay. And if I believe something one day and am presented with new information another day that contradicts this, I'm open and willing to changing my thoughts and beliefs while still maintaining a solid morality of what I feel is right and wrong not to be confused with what is sinful and what is not sinful. Yeah, well, absolutely. And and I think I think that's the key, sort of just being aware and trying to think twice about everything. And I think I, I've definitely felt yeah. happier the more I've relinquished control over over trying to know everything and be right about everything. And the more I've sort of just yeah. taken a breath and gone, you know what, maybe I, I don't actually know the answers to anything. And, and that's actually quite a nice... Uh, feeling. But on that note, we've done about an hour. I just want to say, actually, if anyone's heard that sort of the strange sort of panting noise or anything like that, that is Shalisa's lovely dachshund dog who I got to say hello to at the beginning <laughs> of, of the show. It's not either of us doing weird noises or anything like that. Um, <laughs> Sh Shalise, um but yeah, thank you for being on the edge, Shalise. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure and that hour just completely flew by. I feel like we could talk for hours. So I really appreciate you helping me share my story with your audience and I hope it resonates with some people. 
You are very welcome. And we are going to talk more actually on your channel as well. So uh, that's, a, yes. that's a good way in for people who want to check out Cults to Consciousness uh, on YouTube. There's an audio podcast as well. Go find it. You can find the episode hopefully by the time this comes out or around that time, there'll be that episode with me on it. But check out all the other episodes as well, including the ones we talked about, about sex and weird and interesting and strange things. Uh, thank you everybody for watching and uh, do make sure to keep watching. Hit the like button and there's like things popping up. Oh, there's this other Mormon interview I did that's right here. So go and check that one out.